Evangelistic visitation. Four different phases of visitation we want to look at. First of all, before the campaign begins, then the first week of the campaign, the second and third weeks of the campaign, and baptismal preparation visits. Now again, this is based on a four-week campaign. If your campaign is shorter, then these uh, time frames are going to be uh, tucked under one another just a little bit. So before the campaign begins, the evangelist, or pastor if you should be serving as the evangelist as well, wants to visit those who are currently involved in Bible studies, those who've been attending pre-work events, and backslidden members. The purpose of these really is to develop relationships. And again, we're coming right back to that same thing that we've come back to over and over again. What's this all about? It's about relationships. It's about friendships. So if you've got people that you're already studying the Bible with, or your members are studying the Bible with, or Bible workers are studying the Bible with, those are people that you definitely want to meet with and encourage to come to the seminar before it even begins. Also, those attending pre-work events. If you've been having a... Um, say a vegetarian cooking school or dinner with the doctor or something like that, people who've been coming to that should be given an invitation to come to the evangelistic series that you're doing. One great way to do, for example, a, a dinner with the doctor segue into the evangelistic series or a cooking school segue is to say, you know, you've been coming to this dinner with the doctor seminar for several months now and you've learned basic health principles that can uh, help you to live a longer, happier, healthier life extra five years, maybe 10 years longer if you apply these principles, but how much better would it be if you could live forever? And so you can lead them right into that evangelistic series. We want to give you an invitation, and our ushers are passing out that invitation right now. <clears throat> Another great thing to have at those events, the pre-work events, as you're making that invitation to pe for people to come to the seminar, is a reserved seating card. It's maybe the size of an elongated business card, maybe perforated at one end, that has a ticket describing the, the invitation or describing the series on one half of it and contact information on the tear-off portion. So you give those to the people and you say, please fill this out now. We want to make sure that we reserve some of the best seats for you on opening night. So they tear off that card. They give it back to you. That's your contact information for them. You reserve seats for them. They get the, uh, the tear-off portion to remind them about the upcoming series. Very, very effective in helping people bridge from the pre-work event to the evangelistic campaign itself. And of course, backslidden members. First week of the campaign, you want to visit casually with guests before and after the service. I don't recommend doing in-home visits during the first week of the campaign if these are people who have just come because of a handbill. Now, if you already have an existing relationship with them, certainly you're more than welcome to, to visit with them during the first week of the campaign. But if they just got a handbill in the mail and they show up, and three days into the seminar, you're on their doorstep knocking on their door, they're going to wonder what's going on. It's a little bit weird. After the first week, once you've built some rapport, some trust, some relationships with them, then it's much easier. So again, the purpose of the first week of the campaign is to build relationships, trust, rapport, and confidence. Second and third weeks of the campaign, regular in-home visits with those who show the most interest. These are critical. If you want to see people make decisions during the course of your campaign, you have to visit with them regularly. If all you're doing is preaching the campaign and not visiting with people in the homes or before and after the messages, you are going to see that your decision numbers are very, very low. But when you spend time visiting with them, especially in their homes, you'll see your decision count goes up significantly. Some indicators of interest to let you know that they are moving forward in their decision-making process. Oh, if they're making decisions, if they're asking questions, if they're implementing lifestyle changes. What would be some lifestyle changes that you would uh, hope to see during the course of your series? Stop smoking would be a good one. Yep, anything else? Start running, Start running would be a good one, yeah. <laughs> Sabbath would be another one, right? So there's a number of them that you would expect or at least hope to see during the course of the campaign. As you see those things, you'll know that they're moving in the right direction. Uh, a, few, a few years ago, I did a series in Colorado, and I, we sent out handbills to the community, and a lady received a handbill. Her name is Debbie, and she looked at it, and she thought, man, this is something that I think my, my boyfriend Lance would be interested in. And so uh, she put it on the counter so that when Lance came home, he would find it there. Well, Lance came home, and he found it on the counter, and he looked at it, and he says, wow, Debbie, I'd, I'd really love to go to this. This looks like it's fantastic. 
And she said, yeah, I, I thought you might like to. But she said, I'd like to go to it as well. But if we go, we've got to find some way for, for my son or somebody who's going to take care of my son, Chris. Chris was probably in his late teens, early 20s, and, and extremely disabled um, mentally, physically, in so many ways, and not able to move or care for himself at all. And so they needed respite care for, uh, for her son, Chris. And so they said, well, if we can find respite care for Chris, we'll, we'll go to this. And so they managed to arrange for somebody to take care of him, and they came to the seminar. Well, about a week into the seminar, as uh, Lance was coming and Debbie as well, Lance comes to me and he says to me, you know, Eric, I've been kind of listening to the things that you've been uh, presenting, and I've been, I don't know, I've been, I've been impressed, I've been convicted, maybe that's the word, that I need to make some changes in my life. And I've been, uh, I've been smoking weed now for about 25 years, and I just, I just feel I need to kind of let that go. I haven't talked about the health message or weed or, or anything in my seminar. I've just been presenting the gospel, just showing the Bible, showing Jesus. And so, praise the Lord, Lance, that's fantastic. Well, about a week after that, Lance comes back to me again. He says, Eric, I've been, you know, thinking about all the stuff that I've been learning at the seminar, and, and man, it's really powerful, and I, the Lord's been working on my heart, and I just, I wanted to share with you that I've been, uh, I've been chewing tobacco now for about 30 years, and I just feel that, that I need to let that go, that God wants to take that away from me. Praise the Lord, right? I mean, I haven't talked anything about this, but he's just feeling impressed. He's feeling moved that something needs to happen. So I said, God bless you, Lance. Uh, praise the Lord. Well, about a week and a half later, I've started talking about baptism and so forth in the, uh, in the series, and Lance comes to me again. And he says, Eric, I've been listening to what you've been sharing, and I can see that this is something that God wants me to do, that he wants me to be baptized, but I've, just, I've, got, a, I've got a question for you. You know, as you know, you've been visiting me and Debbie and so forth. We're uh, we're not married, but but we are living together, as you know. I said, yeah, I, I gathered that, right? He said, so I've just got a question. Should we get baptized before we get married, or should we should we get married before we get baptized? <laughs> Praise the Lord, right? I mean, these are the kinds of questions you just want jumping into people's minds. This is, this is God speaking to them as they're coming to the seminar and they're making decisions. I said, I said Lance, that's a great question, and I, and I think I've got a biblical answer for you. And so the pastor and I went over just a, a week or so later, and we had this beautiful marriage ceremony at their home. They'd been you know, living together forever and, and so forth. And the next Sabbath, they got baptized. And Lance is a, an elder in one of the churches there in Colorado today, and they are doing very, very well. So when you start to see people making decisions and implementing lifestyle changes and just saying, the Lord has impressed me that this is what needs to change, these are great signs. Also, when they are sharing with others, when they're taking what they've learned and they're sharing it with somebody else, a great sign. Now, I'm going to talk about follow-up here in the very near future. <clears throat> From time to time, you will find people who are very exuberant in their sharing of what they have learned with others. And it can be important to temper that exuberance uh, in certain areas. You know, they learn about the identity of the Antichrist, <laughs> and you just know they've got a Catholic grandmother, right? And, and I just, I've got to let grandma know. Yes? in time and gently, right? So you kind of have to lead people through that. And I'll talk about that when we talk about uh, follow-up. Second and third week of the campaigns continued. Uh, it's good to announce visits. Let people know that you're available to visit with them and if they are interested in visits. Uh, some people are not going to volunteer for a visit. They won't sign up and request one, but they still need to be visited. So if your visit is unannounced, if they haven't asked for you to come by and visit, Always have an excuse to go by. For example, a gift book or something like that. Something that gives you a reason to be on their doorstep. Take that with you when you go to visit them. And then say something like this. Hi, Benny, it's Eric from the Bible Prophecy Seminar. I just wanted to drop by for a minute and say thank you for coming out to the seminar and to give you this book about the Sabbath 
that I hope will be a blessing to you. I figured if you've come out four or five times to the meetings, the least I can do is come by and tell you thanks. Now, how do you think people will respond to you when you show up and say that on their doorstep? I get, I get so many people who go, wow, you know, I, I've never had my pastor come and visit me, and I've been going to my church for 15 years or something like that. So again, it, it depends on the way you approach it. If you're there to be a blessing to them, and if you've built a relationship with them during the first week or two or three of the seminar, when you show up there on their doorstep, nine times out of 10, if not more, they're excited to see you. Hey, come on in. So they love having you come to visit them. <clears throat> if they invite you in, spend a short period of time getting to know them, and then work on the clear and set questions for the subjects that you have covered in the previous week. Being able to visit with someone in their home is very powerful. It is extremely helpful because it lets you know something about the person that has been coming to the seminar. When you go and you see that their, their lawn is all overgrown and there's 16 cars on cinder blocks with no wheels and tires in the front lawn and a dozen stray dogs running around, that helps you to know a little bit about where they're coming from. Or if you show up on their doorstep and it's a three-story house in a very nice neighborhood with a Mercedes and a BMW and a Bentley in the driveway, tells you a little something about the person that you're visiting. Uh, so depending on where you happen to be, you'll find different people in different areas of life. You walk in the front door, they invite you in. You walk in and you see pictures all over the walls of people. Who are, who are those people likely to be? Family members, right? What, what's a great way to break the ice when you visit? Hey, who are these folks, right? Is this your, this is your... This is your daughter, your son? No, that's my son-in-law. Oh, sorry, you know, there's kind of a family resemblance. You just open it up. If you should happen to see an American flag folded in a triangle in a wooden and glass case on the wall or on the table, do you think it's worthwhile asking about that? Most definitely it is. You're going to get a story. And if you get that story, that helps you again to minister to that person. Find out what their needs are. How can, how can you help them along that road to salvation or to a, a deeper relationship with Jesus? So visiting with someone in the home is very, very important. Fourth, baptismal preparation visits. These usually occur, occur during the fourth and subsequent weeks of the series. Ideally, you, wanted to, to, you want to visit at the church. And this is really just for convenience sake because if you've got a large area of that people are coming from, it takes time to drive from point A to point B to point C to point D if you're visiting a bunch of people. But if you want to clear people for baptism, hopefully at this point in the series, you've got a good relationship with them. Invite them to meet you at the church and say, we'll spend a half an hour or an hour together. And the more people can meet at the church, the more people you can meet with and the more time you can spend with each person. Otherwise, you spend all that time in going from one house to another. Uh, go through the baptismal vows during those visits. <clears throat> In-home visits gives you insights into the daily lives of the guests. If the home is too close, if home is too close for their comfort, visit in a neutral place like a park or a coffee shop. Some people just are not going to feel comfortable having you in their home. A lot of those people, it's because their home is very unkempt. Uh, how many of you have ever been into the home of a hoarder before? Okay, they exist. That's like. 90% of the hands in here. There are people who just feel uncomfortable with anybody seeing how they live. In which case, don't make them feel uncomfortable. Go visit somewhere else. Go to a Starbucks. Go to a Panera. Go to a, a McDonald's. Go, go someplace neutral, and you'll find that they are more apt and open to visit with you. Uh, visits, in-home visits should usually be under half an hour. Don't go and make a three-hour long in-home visit. They are not going to want you back. It's not that they don't like you. It's that just that they don't have time. They've got lives. And so when we take that much time with them, even if it's a really good visit, uh, it ends up usually working against us. Avoid visiting more than once a week during the seminar. Once a week is about right for visiting people during the seminar. If you visit them two, three, four times a week, it's too much. If you're not touching base with them at least once a week, 
it's difficult to clear and set them and see where they happen to be in their decision-making process. So about once a week is what you want to shoot for. Not every visit once a week has to occur in the home. It could occur in the pews or the, the chairs before the meeting or after the meeting. Those are possibilities as well. And the more you can do that, the less you have to visit around the city or the, the town during the course of the week. But uh, do as many as you, can, as you can reasonably get done. Toward the end of the series, you want to be on the lookout for guests who want to pay you off instead of following what they have learned from the Bible. <clears throat> I learned this early on in ministry. When people have been coming to an evangelistic series or doing a series of Bible studies with you, and they're not making decisions, at least good decisions, to move forward in their walk, but they're feeling convicted that they should, a lot of times what they will do is try to do you a personal favor. Either take you out to lunch or dinner or give you a nice gift or something like that. By doing that, in their mind, they have essentially paid off the Holy Spirit. Because I've done something nice for the person who is sharing that with me, I no longer have to do what I feel impressed that I need to do. And so sometimes it'll be a monetary gift. It's, it takes a variety of forms. Now, if somebody is making positive decisions along the way, and they want to have you over for dinner or take you out to lunch or something like that, nine times out of ten, that's just a, a genuine thank you that they want to share with you. But if they're not making those decisions, and then you get this invitation or this gift, most of the time it's a payoff. Now here's what I'll usually do if they offer uh, money or something like that toward the end of the series and they haven't been making the decisions. I'll say, thank you so much for this gift. I'm going to put it back into the fund for the evangelistic meetings or for the prophecy seminar so that other people can benefit from these messages as well. That way, you're not personally benefiting from it, and they realize that even though they tried to pay you off, it's just going to go to spread the gospel to somebody else. So that's one way that you can get around that. Encouragement visits. You want to encourage guests who have fallen away during the course of the seminar to come back. You want to visit them if they have missed two or more nights in a row. I usually won't, miss, won't visit somebody <coughs> if they've only missed one night. One night, maybe they got sick, maybe their kid was late from school, something. You know, things happen to miss one night. But if they've missed two nights, it becomes very easy to miss three. And then it becomes very easy to miss four. And if they've missed three or four nights, it's tough to get them back. So if I notice on their attendance that they've missed two nights in a row, I'm going to be there at their house. If I can't, if I can't get to their house, I'm going to call them. But ideally, I want to get to their house, knock on the door, see how they're doing, and see what's going on. Because if you can get them back after two nights, more than likely you'll keep them for a while longer. Make, uh, take study guides for the missed meetings and a personal note. Uh, let me cover one other thing real quick. When you're making visits, let them be fairly short. And if somebody asks you if you'd like something to eat or to drink or something like that, I will usually just say some. Well, a couple different things that you can do. I'll usually eat something small just before I go out on visitation, a granola bar or something like that. And that way they say, would you like something to eat? What will I say? Yeah, I just ate. I just had something to eat. Thank you. Appreciate that, right? Or I might say, you know, if you just have a glass of water, that'd be fantastic. But if people, if you're making regular visits to people and they are providing food for you or start to provide food for you or do it even once, what in their mind is the expectation the next time you come to visit? They've got to provide something for you again. And so it becomes, a, it becomes a burden for them. You become a burden to them. Now, I say this using common sense. We went to go visit this, uh, it was a mother-daughter who were coming to our series. Lovely ladies, wonderful ladies. They had what, what we often call the gift of hospitality they arranged or asked for us to come, the pastor and, and, and me, to come and visit them. And we showed up at their fairly humble home. And when we got in there, they had a table spread, spread with, I've never seen so many hors d'oeuvres and finger foods and everything, handmade and baked and cooked and rolled and I'm, you walked in and your, your olfactory glands just went nuts. It was just, wow. And, and 
what do you do? Say, no thanks, I just ate. No, No, you don't do that. You say, thank you so much. You were really, (laughs) it wasn't necessary, but we are so grateful. Uh, Thank you. And so we enjoyed it. We had take-home boxes of stuff to enjoy, and, and so, so it, it was really wonderful. When that happens, yes, you, you, you do the wise thing, and you appreciate their hospitality. But generally speaking, say, uh, thank you very much, just had something to eat, or, or a glass of water would, would be fantastic. All right, let's uh, move into the second to the last one, clearing for baptism. I think we'll have a, a moment or two for questions at the very end here. Clearing for baptism, Evangelism 308. The preparation for baptism is a matter that needs to be carefully considered. The new converts to the truth should be faithfully instructed in the plain, thus saith the Lord. The word of the Lord is to be read and explained to them point by point. All who enter upon the new life should understand prior to their baptism that the Lord requires the undivided affections. The practice of the truth, practicing of the truth is essential. The bearing of fruit testifies to the character of the tree. We were just talking about them making decisions and lifestyle changes. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. The line of demarcation will be plain and distinct between those who love God and keep his commandments and those who love him not and disregard his precepts. There is need of a thorough conversion to the truth. So clearing a candidate for baptism. A well-cleared candidate will look back on their baptism as a monumental moment in their life. They're going to say, this was something special. This was something important. This was when my life turned around and headed in the right direction. So when we help them to experience that, that sticks around forever. A candidate who is, a candidate who is baptized prematurely will have a more difficult path ahead. They're going to find that other members of the church have different standards than they do, believe things differently than they do. And that causes frustration not just for them, but for who else? The rest of the church, right? You know, why was so-and-so baptized when they're still doing this, or they're not doing that, or they're still working on the Sabbath, or they're fill in the blank? And then you start to get members who wonder whether, why can't I do this? Or why can't I? And it causes, well, issues. How many of you have had an issue or two in your churches? Okay. If you've been pastoring for at least a week, more than likely you have. Uh, Perfection is not required. Person doesn't have to be perfect in order to be baptized. Of course not. If we had to be perfect, how many of us would have been baptized? None of us, right? But active participation in a known sin means that the candidate is not yet ready for baptism. If they are still, we've often heard that uh, baptism is kind of like getting married, right? You don't have to be perfect to get married. But should you be actively dating other people? at the time that you get married. You know, if a young man came to a young lady and said, you know, if, I, I think if we could get married, I could just stop dating all those other girls, right? Probably not gonna work. Shouldn't work, right? But there shouldn't, don't have to be perfect, but shouldn't be actively dating the devil either. Testimonies to the church, 91 and 92. There is need of a more thorough preparation on the part of candidates for baptism. They are in need of more faithful instruction than has usually been given them. The principles of the Christian life should be made plain to those who have newly come to the truth. None can depend upon their profession of faith as proof that they have a saving connection with Christ. We are not only to say, I believe, but to practice the truth. It is by conformity to the will of God in our words, our deportment, our character, that we prove our connection with him. Whenever one renounces sin, which is the transgression of the law, his life will be brought into conformity to the law, into perfect obedience. This is the work of who? The Holy Spirit. The light of the word carefully studied, the voice of conscience, the strivings of the Spirit, again you see the Spirit working, produce in the heart genuine love for Christ, who gave himself a whole sacrifice to redeem the whole person, body, soul, and spirit. And love is manifested in obedience. Once a thorough presentation of the truths of God's word has taken place in the meetings, invite people to follow Christ in taking the step of baptism. And again, this is one of the areas where John uh, mentioned yesterday he invites people to to take part in an altar call. How do you prepare them for baptism? I like to hold baptismal classes about a week prior to the end of the meetings, uh, then do individual appointments 
The week, uh, the baptismal preparation or the baptismal classes that I like to hold, usually during the fourth week of meetings, I'll hold them maybe three nights a week, typically right after the evening message. Let's say it's a, say we meet on a Monday night, Wednesday night, Friday night, something like that. About 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes right after the meetings, and I'll break down the baptismal vows into three different sections, and each evening go through one of those three sections with them. We'll read some Bible passages. I'll invite them to go home and read a few more as homework. If they have questions, come back the next night. We'll ask and answer those questions. Then, set up the individual appointments. Of course, you as the local pastor would be involved in those and go over the list of requirements for baptism. It should be the same as what was gone over during the baptismal preparation classes. So that way, they're getting it the second time. So typically, uh, I'll often present a... Uh, a message during the latter part of the series called, uh, what do we do? I think we do a, a final events of Bible prophecy message, which is kind of a, I have the pastor preach essentially Genesis to Revelation, the whole story chronologically, how it all fits together, weaving in the different uh, elements, the 28 fundamental beliefs. And then toward the end of that, I'll go through as a review class with everybody who's in the seminar, the baptismal vows. And so everybody, whether member or guest or whatever, they go through those things, and it's a, it serves as a seminar feedback form for me. Also, I'd just like to know how clearly I've presented these things over the last few weeks. If you'd be willing to, to look through these as we run through them, and if you believe them or are in general agreement with them, put a check, a check mark next to that statement. If you're not in general agreement with the statement, put an X next to that statement. And this lets me know whether I've done a good job of presenting the seminar. And then we have them hand them in. Now I've got a, a form from everybody who's come to the seminar that tells me exactly what they believe or don't believe and how close they are ready to baptism or not. Then we go through the baptismal preparation classes. Then we do the individual visits with them. So by the time somebody's baptized, they've gone through the vows three times. Now, I've followed in the footsteps of evangelists that have gone before me into, those, into various towns, and I get members who say, yeah, the last evangelist who came through here, he baptized a whole bunch of people. But you know what? Half of them didn't know they were joining the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And most, most of them aren't in church anymore. How many of you have seen that or heard that before? Okay? It happens. I would rather that they know as much as is reasonably possible before they make that decision than do a, pull a bait and switch on them. People don't like that. They get upset, and rightly so. So I like to, I like to make sure they know what they're doing. And if they're not quite ready that's okay. Let them percolate a little while longer. You know, one of the challenges that we've faced over the years, Jesus told us that the harvest is what? Plentiful. It's great, but the laborers are few. When you go out to harvest fruit, what type of fruit should you harvest? Ripe fruit, right? Have you ever tried to harvest fruit when it's not ripe? Like let's say a, uh, an apple, you tried to pull an apple off a tree when it's still green? Yeah, it doesn't like to come off, does it? You're yanking and pulling and stretching. What's happening to the tree and the branch? It's flying all over. Leaves are flying all over. And the, uh, the, the branch breaks and you finally get that apple off and you bite into it. How's it taste? Kind of bitter, chalky, nasty. Is the apple happy now? No. Are you happy? No. Is the tree happy? No. Nobody's happy, right? So... Let it hang on the tree a little while longer. If they're not ready, keep working with them. That's what follow-up is for. You don't have to baptize everybody right when the meetings come to an end. If you've got a good follow-up system in place, you're going to keep reaping over the months after that. So very important. Now, vigil, individual appointments, again, include yourself as a local pastor. If you're not the speaker, <clears throat> go over the list of requirements. Practical items for baptism. People want to bring a swimsuit or shorts and a t-shirt to wear under the baptismal robe. I'm going to discourage the wearing of white clothing, and you probably know why. Right? I, I am not a fan of white baptismal robes. Now, I know that white represents purity, but I have been to some baptisms where there were distractions. Is that, is, did I put that delicately enough? Okay. Where, <laughs> where there have been distractions. 
and an event that was supposed to be a spiritual highlight of a person's life has turned into a moment of embarrassment that has been caught on film and video by dozens, if not hundreds of people. Okay. I like maroon baptismal robes or blue baptismal robes or even black baptismal robes. And again, I get the white thing. But I recommend that people, because you never know what color the robe may be, to wear something dark underneath whatever robe you're gonna get. So wear a dark t-shirt, dark shorts, dark swimsuit, something along those lines. Change of dry undergarments, a towel, and a plastic bag for wet clothes. I found that plastic bags work better than paper ones. <clears throat> yeah. Baptism day should be an exciting day for everyone. You wanna build the entire service around the main event of baptism to highlight its significance. Uh, some different things that you could give to, uh, to people on that day who are baptized. You can give them a conflict at the ages set. That's great. Uh, homemade bread, a bottle of grape juice, a book about the Adventist church. There's some very nice ones out there. Uh, a little bit of the history and the... <clears throat> there are even some that, can, that include a, a glossary of Adventist terms. <clears throat> Adventees. You know we speak a different language, right? Yeah. Haystacks is one of them. I remember when I became a member of the Adventist church, as I, as I was making my way that direction, I, I told you about this young lady that I met a few years ago. Well, we, uh, we hit it off fairly well, and I hung out with her quite a bit. And one day, she asked me if I wanted to go with her to the ABC. <laughs> I thought, the ABC? <laughs> I thought she was this nice, wonderful Christian girl. <laughs> now, some of you, most of you, many of you know what the ABC is, right? That's a liquor store. The ABC is the liquor store. So she says, would you like to go to the ABC together? And I'm hearing her say, you want to go to the liquor store? I'm like, what just happened to her, right? But no, she, went, she meant the Adventist Book Center. So it, it helps to to acclimate people to this new environment when they have an idea of what some of these Adventist terms are. I mean, we talk about the GC and the NAD. We talk about Sabbath school. We talk about uh, the spirit of prophecy, the investigative judgment, uh, shut door, open door, you know, whole, whole nine years. We talk about all this stuff, and the vast majority of people, they don't know what we're talking about. That's only the in-club knows and understands. And so if we can help to acclimate them to this new language, uh, it's really, really beneficial. Another nice thing that I've seen done is like a basket with some of these things, uh, a plant to symbolize the growth of their Christian life and things like that. So a variety of different things you could do. <clears throat> After the service, plan a follow-up meal to allow existing members to meet new members and their families. Uh, Acts 2.41 says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized in the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Acts 2.47, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Uh, one thing I want to touch on before I, I leave this section, and I'm keeping a... Doing I'm doing all right? Okay. <clears throat> when, at what age is it appropriate for a person to be baptized, for a young person to be baptized? Now, I'll, I'll share my experience, and then you may do with it what you will. What I have often run into as I've been involved in evangelism over the years <clears throat> is I'll have parents of 16, 17, 18-year-old kids come to me and they'll say, please, would you come and visit with my son or daughter? I really want them to be baptized. They haven't been baptized yet. They've wandered out into the world. When they were younger, they were really excited about church and they wanted to get baptized. What I find is younger people six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, that age range, they fall in love with Jesus. They may not know everything, but they know they want to be with Jesus. And so they go to mom and dad and they say, can I get baptized? And what do mom and dad often say? No, why not? Because you're too young, right? And so they kind of are a little dejected and they go back and maybe six months later, year later, Maybe they hear another, they go to church camp or they, you know, in Sabbath school, they hear a particularly touching presentation of Jesus and his love for them. They come to mom and dad again and mom, dad, I really want to get baptized. What do mom and dad often say? 
still too young, just wait a little while till you're a little older and so forth. Okay, they go through that four, five, six times. What ends up happening? They quit asking the question, right? They've been told no enough times that they just say, forget it. Fast forward, and now they're 16, 17, 18 years old. They have no more interest in it, and mom and dad are coming to me, the evangelist, hoping that I can come and work a miracle. 99 times out of 100, that's not in my capacity to do. Um, actually, 100 times out of 100. <clears throat> so, should they have baptized them earlier or not? What, what's the right age? He, here's, the way, here's the way that I've approached it. And again, feel free to do with it as you will. When I have a young person who comes to me during the seminar and tells me that they want to get baptized, I'll set up a time to meet with the young person and with the parents. And I'll talk with the parents and ask them a little bit about the child's relationship with the Lord. What are, what are they doing? Are they doing regular devotional time? Do they, have they confessed their sins to Jesus? Have they accepted him as their savior? Things like that. And then depending on kind of the answers that the parents give me and so forth, I'll, I'll ask them this question. I'll ask them, do you believe that your son or your daughter is old enough to be lost. In other words, if they were to die today, could they be lost? With the knowledge that they have, could they be lost? And if mom and dad say, yes, I believe that my child could be lost if they were to die today, then I will say, if they're old enough to be lost, then I believe they're old enough to be saved. And I will suggest that they consider baptism for the child. Now, does baptism save the child, yes or no? No, it doesn't. But there is an indicator of the maturity of the child. If the parents believe that they would be old enough, they have enough knowledge, understanding, and so forth to be lost at that particular point in life. I would rather, I would rather baptize the child a little too early and later on have to rebaptize them when their relationship has grown and matured, then never have them baptized. Now, I say that very carefully and judiciously, but I, I trust that you understand where I'm coming from with that. So that's kind of been the approach that I have taken, and it, has, it seems to have served fairly well. So uh, anyway, as you're dealing with, uh, with children or young people, that's something that I... There was a young man named Seth. I bumped into him in Arkansas. He was 10 years old. He came to the seminar, and he just, he was eating it up, loving it, loving it. And he came to me toward the end of the seminar, and he said to me, Eric, I want to be baptized. I said, great, let's go talk to your parents and see what they think and so forth. And then I sat down with Seth, and I went through some of the basic questions that you will ask a person who's getting baptized. And I found out very quickly that Seth at 10 years old, knew a whole lot more about the Bible than a lot of adults that I visit with. And then I asked, quest I asked Seth a question. I said, Seth, tell me, just in simple terms, why do you want to be baptized? And Seth looked me straight in the eye. He says, because I love Jesus. That's all I need to hear. That's, that's the reason. That's the reason. And Seth, Seth was baptized. I've still got a picture of Seth's baptism big smile on his face. I mean, ear to ear, he came up out of that baptismal tank beaming, just an excited young man. And so, anyway, something to think about as far as, uh, as baptisms go. One last section here on follow-up, and then we'll have a couple of minutes for questions. Evangelism 334. When the arguments for present truth are presented for the first time, it is difficult to fasten the points upon the mind. True? And although some may see sufficiently to decide, yet for all this, there is need of going all over the very same ground again and giving another course of lectures. After the first efforts have been made in place of, after the first efforts have been made in a place by giving a course of lectures, there is really greater necessity for a second course than for the first. So you present the message, all well and good, but it's more important that you present it a second time, she says. <clears throat> the truth is new and startling, and the people need to have the same presented the second time to get the points distinct and the ideas fixed in the mind. Follow-up is one of the most important parts of the cycle of evangelism, and a multi-pronged approach I've found to be the most effective. 
few different things you can, uh, you can weave into this multi-pronged approach. Follow-up meetings. Host a midweek follow-up seminar that is related to the original series. If you've been meeting together for several weeks, four nights a week, five nights a week, and people are they're feasting on the truths of the Bible, don't get to the last night and say, God bless you, we'll see you in a week next Sabbath where you'll hear a 25, 30, 40 minute sermon and we hope that that'll feed you for the rest of your week. They, they've, they're, they're in fifth gear. Don't shift into park. Okay? Bring them down. You don't want to stay in fifth gear all the time. But have a midweek meeting. Could focus on the books of Daniel or Revelation, prophecy from another angle, etc. Cover the same truths with greater depth and explanation. The follow-up meetings, it's good to have a more interactive environment. Typically, when you're preaching the evangelistic series, you've got the speaker, yourself, or someone else up front, and you're speaking to the congregation. If you can have more of an interactive environment in the follow-up, it encourages participation on their part and asking of questions. Very helpful. <clears throat> Second, a pastor's Sabbath school class. This is a class composed of hand-selected, solid members, church leaders, new members, and seminar guests. This is one thing that I always recommend a church does at the end of a series. Set up a special class, if one doesn't already exist, for new members and guests coming to the seminar who haven't yet made that, that decision. The people who should be in it, like I said, hand-selected. These, these would be selected by the pastor and or the evangelist. These are specific church members that we want to have in this class. Why? Because in many churches, probably not yours, but every other church than yours, there are members that we really don't necessarily want to get well connected with our new folk. Right? I, I affectionately call them snipers. Here's what they will do. They will sit back quietly and patiently while you do all of the hard work of bringing these new people out of the community and into the church. And once they're ready to make that decision or they've just made that decision, then these snipers will move in and they will grab a hold of these new people and they'll say something like this. Aren't these, aren't these truths wonderful that you've been learning night by night? Isn't this just uplifting and so forth? I mean, I've seen how it's changed your life. It changed mine too. But you know, there's one thing that the pastor didn't share during the seminar. Truth. And then they'll take that person away and whatever their little pet drum is that they like to beat, they'll feed that to the new person and they'll, they'll pull them away from the rest of the flock and turn them into their own disciple. That needs to be guarded against. So I will recommend a, a pastor's Sabbath school class that has hand-selected solid members, elders, leaders, deacons, special people that you want these new people to especially connect with and exclude from this class people that you do not want in there. Now, <clears throat> can that cause some friction? Yes, it can. I remember a series I was doing in California, and we were getting to the end, and I was working with the pastor to, to hand-select people from his church to put in this new, this new members, this pastor's Sabbath school class. And we had made those determinations, and an older couple from the church came to us, and they said, we'd like to be a part of this class too. Now, during the course of the time I'd been there, I'd picked up a few hints, we'll call it that way, that this older couple was not really the couple that we wanted connecting with the new guests, the new people. And so I said to them, <clears throat> that's very generous of you to offer. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, we've already got the class filled, but thanks for you know, showing an interest. And they said, no, we want to be in the class. I said, uh, again, thank you so much. I appreciate your generosity and you know, so forth. But really, the, the class is it's filled now. Thank you. And they said, we want in that class. And I said, thank you, but you're not invited to be a part of that class. And they said, you either let us in that class or we will leave this church. I said, God bless you. And they left the church. 
Now, was I too harsh? Did we want them in the class with the new people? All they were going to do was to work mayhem and havoc on the new members. So it can cause a little friction. There can be some toes stepped upon. But ultimately, we want to make sure that these new babes in Christ have an incubator that they can grow up in so that they can become adults in Christ. And it's very, very important. What's the uh, content of this class? Designate time each week. I'll recommend a few things for Bible marking, for learning how to answer difficult questions, a little bit of the history of the church and so forth. The reason I like to include a portion of time in Bible marking and learning how to answer difficult questions is if they've just joined the church, people are going to ask them about why they're doing what they're doing, why they believe what they believe. And for them to just say, well, pastor so-and-so said, I went to a seminar where they said, it really doesn't give them much to stand on. But if you can teach them, show them how to mark their Bible and spend time going through common questions that they're going to get about the Sabbath, the state of the dead, and so forth, then when somebody asks them, they're prepared. They feel confident that they can give an answer for the hope that is in them with meekness and fear, right? And they don't need to carry around with them a, a file box full of Bible studies and concordances and so forth. All they need is their Bible with everything marked in there. And it's really easy. So I love to, I love to give that as a toolkit to new people who, uh, who come into the church. Or again, this is for people who haven't yet made that decision but are close. This just enforces it, reinforces it. A little bit of the history of church, church is helpful too. New members should stay for several quarters in this class before graduating to a Sabbath school class of their own choosing. <clears throat> Each Sabbath morning, uh, do new member interviews. Each Sabbath morning, the pastor should introduce a new member family to the congregation from the front during announcement time. This interview should take about two to four minutes. Not very long, but it gives an opportunity for the members of the church to get to know, know the new people. All this should be rehearsed beforehand and so forth. But if, you find, if you've got Bob, who's a new member of the church, and he's a plumber, and you introduce Bob and his wife to the congregation, and Sam is a, a plumber in the congregation, what's Sam probably going to do after the service? He's going to connect with him, going to go and introduce himself. And you build these connections. And I forget what the statistics are. Somebody probably could rattle them off to me. But something like you need to have seven new good quality friends within the first six months. Does that sound about right? Okay. Um, in order to stay in the church. Now, a good quality friend is more than someone who happens to see you on Sabbath and who says, Happy Sabbath, brother. When somebody says to you, happy Sabbath, brother, what does that usually mean? Usually means they don't know your name, right? That's just, happy Sabbath, brother means, uh, I forget your name, but I'm going to smile and be happy anyway, right? So when, when you can rock up to somebody and say, happy Sabbath, Sam, happy Sabbath, Reggie, happy Sabbath, Barbara, that, that has a deeper meaning, deeper meaning. Two to four minutes in length, not real long, but uh, should be there. Spiritual friends. Connect new members with longtime members in a similar age group or with similar interests. The longtime member family should interact with the new fam member family several times a week. This should not be haphazard. It should be very structured, where at once a week or once every two weeks, there is a, a gathering together, a meeting of the spiritual friends, the members of the church, together with a leader, so you can give a, a report on how things are going with the family that you're assigned to. So all very structured. <clears throat> church socials. Plan several church socials following the evangelistic series. Could be picnic, game night, holiday banquet. Small groups encourage participation, growth, and accountability. Have strong small group leaders in place even before the seminar begins. Don't try to start small groups at the same time your seminar ends. Get that all going long beforehand so they can just drop in and flow with it. Bring new members into small groups as the seminars close. A few final points. Follow-up leads to greater retention of new members. Have a follow-up plan to avoid new members feeling alone or abandoned after baptism and to ensure positive, healthy, spiritual friendships from the start. A final charge. Here we go. Tying things off. Acts of the Apostles, page 109. All over the world, men and women are looking wistfully to heaven. Prayers and tears and inquiries go up from souls longing for light, for grace, for the Holy Spirit. Many are on the ver <laughs> verge of the kingdom, waiting only to be gathered in. They're just waiting for us. The greatest work in the world includes some of the greatest joys and the greatest disappointments. You're going to find some of the greatest happiness that you could have, 
and you're going to cry some of the worst tears that you've ever cried when you are involved in the work of soul winning. You know that. It causes you to seek your Savior more than ever before and gives you a greater appreciation for Jesus' sacrifice for the salvation of men. Evangelism 3.28 says, God and not man is the judge of man's work, and he will apportion to each his just reward. It is not given to any human being to judge between the different servants of God. The Lord alone is the judge and rewarder of every good work. So he's the one who determines success, not us. Page 329, the Lord will not judge you by the amount of success manifested in your efforts. I was bidden to tell you that your faith must be kept revived and firm and constantly increasing. When you see that those who have ears will not hear and that those who are intelligent will not understand, after you have done your best, pass on to regions beyond and leave the result with God. But let not your faith fail. The work that is done to the honor and glory of God will bear the seal of God. Christ will endorse the work of those who will do their best. And as they continue to do their best, they will increase in knowledge and the character of their work will be improved. In comparison to the number that reject the truth, those that receive it will be very small. But one soul is of more value than worlds beside. We must not become discouraged, although our work does not seem to bring large returns. Measuring success is not by the number of baptisms. It is not by church growth. True success comes in your faithfulness. As you are faithful to sharing the word of God and encouraging people to follow Jesus, do your best, trust God, and leave the results to him.